Well, hello to everyone out there today. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, again, good afternoon to all you East Coasters out there. Uh, good morning to all you Central Timers and beyond. Thanks for joining us again um, today for our uh, our second webinar in our spring series here. For today, we'll be talking about the, the top five use opportunities for Canvas stack. And so if you tuned in yesterday, we did an overview of the science behind tree growth regulators in Canvas stack. And so today what the intent is going to be is really to dig more into um, some of the practical in the field applications and show examples and share ideas of how tree growth regulators in Canvas stack can um, be really functional in the landscape um, and be a really great service to help trees out there in our landscapes for our clients. Um, and so with that, of course, just real quick housekeeping. Again, this webinar is worth one ISA CEU. And so when you registered for this webinar, if you did not put in your ISA um, certification number at that time, if you go right ahead on over to the, uh, the side panel there and uh, type, um, click on this little area here that says chat and put your um, your ISA CEU number in there right now. We will capture that and make sure you get your CEU. Uh, the other thing is, is at any time today while you have questions, see this other little triangle right here by questions. If you click on that, that'll bring that down. And again, what we'll do here is if you have any questions throughout the webinar today, you can type them in right there. And then again, as we, um, as we conclude with the discussion, uh, we'll try to get to any questions that folks might have with whatever time we have remaining. Um, so, and the other thing is this webinar and yesterday's webinar and all the webinars will be recorded and put up on our website. So, any of the past webinars we've done, uh, including this one after today, can be found on treecarescience.com uh, under the education tab. Um, so with that, let's continue to move on. So again, my name is Patrick Anderson. Uh, my role at Rainbow Scientific is as an arborologist, where again, I travel the country uh, working with Rainbow's clients in the field with diagnostic support, protocol support, uh, things of that nature. Um, perhaps we'll get a chance to meet in person one day, um, and I would love that. And of course, my information there is at the bottom uh, for any time to call, email, or text me. Uh, below that, of course, is our technical support number where you can find live uh, support uh, during normal business hours, uh, East and uh, Central Time. Um, and again, we have a, any if you need questions with ordering, uh, product support, all that kind of thing, that can be found there through that tech support number. And of course, our website, treecarescience.com. Uh, as you know, we are based in science. So when we offer a product or a protocol out to you in the marketplace, you guys can be confident that it is indeed backed by good sound science. Um, and so uh, yesterday I had a slide for the trials that we did in 2016. I looked up our trials from this past year. In this past year, we did 75 research trials. So in 2017 alone, we did 75 um, replicated research trials. Again, to continue to explore these different insects, disease, and tree care protocols to bring you guys the best possible support um, that we can. And of course, um, at this point, we have created over 160 unique protocols to manage trees and shrubs in our landscape. And as, you know, again, many of you know, uh, we provide infield training. We put on events throughout the country, educational events, um, as well as white sheets and different diagnostic sheets that um, we can help you with um, growing your business and helping to take care of trees and shrubs out there in that landscape. And of course, uh, finally, we, we all align to this group of um, core values. And as I always like to point out to people, there's two things I like to point out. One is, of course, is that we are science-based. So when we talk about a product or a protocol, um, know that that is backed by sound, peer-reviewed, replicated trial research products. Um, and again, what we always expound upon is the predictable results. And predictable results might not be you know, what you want to hear, but, you know, offering in those predictable results, their science back. And then finally, um, what I always like to point out here is this honesty and integrity. Um, again, 
we want to make sure that we are bringing the best possible uh, research um, protocols to the marketplace. And so we stand, stand by that. But today, what we're really going to be talking about is, again, these Canvas stat use opportunities. And so we've broken these down into five different use opportunities out there in the landscape. And so they would include improved performance, or excuse me, approved, improved appearance, drought resistance, disease resistance, reduction of urban stress, and then a reduction of um, labor, and that has to do with pruning uh, when using tree growth regulators in Canvas stat. Just a really quick review, again, we covered this yesterday, and, and many of you are probably aware of these things, but when we're applying Canvas stat, what we're doing is we're asking the plant to alter different kind of hormones within itself and how they're produced. And of course, from a growth regulation standpoint, we're asking the plant to not produce so much gibberellic acid, which is responsible for cell elongation and expansion. And part of that, some of the elements that go into that gibberellin production also go into chlorophyll production. So when we talk about approved appearance, what we're really talking about, what we're really going to be focusing on is examples of how we are able to make plants look greener by creating more chlorophyll. Uh, the other hormonal change that we're doing is that we're asking the plant to create more cystic acid. And cystic acid plays a whole host of roles in the plant that we'll discuss, um, again, from a practical standpoint. But again, what it's gonna do is it's gonna help promote fine absorptive root growth. It's gonna help with um, the tree responding faster to drought symptoms by closing the stomates faster and for a longer period of time. It helps, in general, with cells from dehydration. It also can help stimulate some of these phytodefense compounds. And so we'll discuss all these uh, in these different kind of sections here. And then real quick, too, we talked about this, is the, the tree energy budget theory as proposed by Dr. Dan Herm. And so what this is stating is that trees put their energy into these five different buckets. That would include above ground top growth, reproductive structures like flowers and fruiting, root growth, and again, that's that fine absorptive root growth, defense compounds and storage compounds. And if we ask the plant by using canvas that, to stop putting so much energy into that above ground top growth, well, the plant's still gonna have all those resources. It's still gonna collect the same amount of resources from the soil, still gonna collect the same amount of solar energy, but it's then gonna be able to reallocate that energy into these different buckets. And so that's where we're gonna also start seeing this improved appearance, this uh, drought resistance and disease resistance, things like that. So let's begin with improved appearance, number one on our list of five. So as I mentioned, as we already talked about here, um, when we do is when we are asking the plant not to produce so much of that gibberellin, some of those resources go directly into producing chlorophyll. Not all of them, but it frees up these elements to produce more chlorophyll. And so across the board, across species, we're going to see a plant that is greening up. And so if we look at this picture here, this is a picture of a northern red oak. On our left is a plant that has not been treated, and on our right is a plant that has been treated. In this case here, there's been no other treatment. There's been no fertilizer applied. There has been no um, root disturbance and decompaction. In this case, the only thing we've done is we have applied a low volume soil drench of canvas that to the tree, and within a year, we're seeing these results. And so the cool thing about this is I know we've all run into situations where, you know, when we're talking about fertilization, we need to affect a large volume of soil to make the best possible reaction in the tree. Because when we talk about fertilization, we're not talking about, you know, we, we discuss fertilizing the plant, but really what we're doing is we're putting available nutrients into the soil then the plant can take up. But if we have restrictions around that, you know, if we have a tree in a tree grate or if we have a tree in maybe a, um, you know, a courtyard where we just can't affect a lot of soil, we're not going to be able to put those nutrients in there. We have an option now with canvas stat to apply it just, again, low volume to the base of the tree and affect a change in the color of the plant, which, again, is going to make the plant shine. It's going to really, um, you know, again, one, from the plant health standpoint, it's going to be able to produce more chlorophyll, which is going to be able to, in turn, produce more energy. And then from a client standpoint, it's just going to make the, the tree look better. And so here's an example right here. So this is this is a picture. Uh, the tree on the left, the chlorotic looking tree, and the tree on the right, again, a year before this picture was taken, 
Uh, they looked identical. So we had two chlorotomies These are pin oaks. They're found in a high-pitched soil. This is in southeastern Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. The tree on the right was treated with canvasat. One year later, that's the kind of reaction that we're seeing. So after one year after application, with no other applications being done, again, no fertilization or anything like that, we were able to take chlorotic looking tree and turn it into a tree that is now green. And you compare that to its neighbor, it's like night and day. So, <laughs> excuse me. So again, just some of the options here that we have now with using um, these growth regulators. This is another example. This is in Charlotte, North Carolina. This is a red maple. Uh, again, one year after application with canvas stat, you can see the difference in our treated and untreated leaf there. Um, pretty remarkable. Again, it opens up a whole new opportunity for us uh, in these certain situations. Not that I'm saying we still don't want to do soil sampling, correct prescription fertilization, decompaction treatments, things like that. But this just brings us one more opportunity, one more tool in situations where that's not inappropriate due to the site. We have maybe a restriction with the client's budget. They don't, they can't afford to do that for whatever reason, uh, but they still want to affect their tree in a positive way. And again, practically speaking, um, you know, as in my past life as a practice, practicing arborist, this is where we, we use canvas that really often um, in these like kind of really compact backyard type areas where we didn't have an option to do a, a full fertilization, correct fertilization, we were able to employ the canvas that. And of course, because it's going to slow growth, there's also some benefits to that, that growth reduction there. You can combine canvas stat again with these other things. So, you know, maybe you can combine this with your fertilization. A good, or one of the things that we see often um, where our clients are using canvas stat is combining it with uh, iron injections. Uh, for chlorosis uh, using verdure, verdure manganese. And as an example here, you know, we had a tree that was really suffering uh, and we combined treatments here. So, because again, the canvas stack can take up to a year in some cases to start seeing that green up. So with our verdure, we know we're going to get very quick green up. Um, and then the canvas stack will start kind of reacting in the plant and we'll start seeing that improved chlorophyll production, uh, you know, after application. And now this isn't very well researched, but anecdotally speaking, we've had situations where we've done things like this, and you know, again, 10 years down the line, the tree is green and beautiful. So we've done a one-time treatment, the tree is able to recover enough, produce more roots, what have you, um, and can now be self-sustaining. So we haven't had her treat over and over again. We've been able to do one treatment and affect the tree for a larger period of time, which is pretty neat. Um, as we move forward now, and of course, you know, we talk about appearance. Appearance is pretty uh, superficial, but all these things are going to play into this appearance. And obviously, if we can improve drought resistance and disease resistance, the plant's going to look better. But if we're talking about, you know, just simply we want this plant to look greener, um, that's the appearance that we we're just kind of discussing there. So we know that we can affect the plant, create more chlorophyll, make it look greener, affect that chlorosis. Um, and again, from an appearance standpoint, a site standpoint, we've done a great thing uh, for the client and for the tree. Let's move into our next bucket here, which is drought resistance. So with drought resistance, as we mentioned, the big thing here is, is we're going to increase the amount of cystic acid in the plant. So this is from a physiological standpoint. This is a big thing. So when we increase the amount of cystic acid in the plant, the plant is able to respond to drought conditions faster. So again, I love this graphic. Uh, I saw it from the Davy Twitter feed. Um, again, if there's any Davy people out there, thank you very much for this. If not, then again, it's between us and we don't have to let them know. But this graphic is great because it really explains what happens when a plant goes under drought stress. And so again, it's the roots that first realize that the soil is running out of water. So the roots realize they are no longer harvesting the correct amount of water. So they create this chemical system that goes up through the roots, through the trunk, and finally up into the leaf where it triggers that stomate to close. And again, when we have an increased amount of cystic acid within the plant, that reaction happens faster. So we don't have such a delayed response. The reaction happens faster. The stomates are allowed to close, and we're able to hold on to more moisture within the leaf. And again, we mentioned this like yesterday, but 
when we think about where we're planting our trees and shrubs, you know, very few of us are foresters managing trees and shrubs in a forest. Most of us are arborists or landscape managers managing these trees and shrubs in this urban-suburban interface. And so what this says here is, again, lack of rain isn't the only contributing factor to drought. Compacted soils, concrete, and warmer soil can all cause drought stress on a plant. So, again, we might have a year that has ample amounts of moisture coming out of the sky. We have plenty of rainfall, but because of where we're planting these trees and these, this urban-suburban interface, next to buildings where we're getting heat reflection, you know, again, putting concrete sidewalks and asphalt over within the root system, again, stopping that infiltration of soil or of water into the soil, creating more heat reflection, warming that soil up, we're inducing a drought response into these plants. So if we can do something just to help that, then we've already done a great thing for our plants, our trees, and our woody ornamental shrubs out there in the landscape. This is a trial that was done by Dr. Glenn Percival. And so in this trial, what he did is, again, he induced um, oak trees, potted oak trees, to drought. This is a replicated trial, so we had some of these plants that were untreated, and we had some of these plants that were treated. And so I'd just like to call everyone's attention to this last row, survival. So all these controlled plants, so all the plants that were not treated with paclobutrazol, he had a 20% survival rate. So only 20% of his untreated plants survived this treatment of um, drought stress. Others treated at different rates, doesn't matter if it was a very low rate or a very high rate, he was able to have a 100% survival rate of his oak trees in this study. So again, what this is showing us is that with the very easy to do low volume application of canvas that we're able to affect the plant in a very positive way, help to withstand these conditions that we're forcing it to go into. If we look at some more pictures here from the Morton Arboretum, again, the treated or the untreated plant on our left, that is drought-induced leaf scorch. The treated plant on our right, that has, again, been treated with canvas bat, and we can see the difference there. Part of what's happening here as well is we are changing the morphology of the plant. So we are creating the new leaves after treatment will have a thicker, waxy cuticle. And that waxy cuticle, again, is going to prevent leaf moisture from escaping. So we're going to be able to retain more moisture in our leaf with that thicker waxy cuticle, which again is going to play into this drought resistance that we're speaking about right now. The other thing we're going to see represented with this picture below right here is we're going to have an increased amount of trichome hairs, those microscopic hairs that surround all leaves and needles. And with that increased amount of trichome hairs per volume or seen by area of leaf surface is we're going to create this microclimate around the plant, which again is going to help us retain moisture in the summertime when it's hot and dry, as well as if we have an uh, evergreen species, a species that does not shed leaves or needles, it'll help us to create that microclimate and reduce moisture loss in the winter time as well. This is just a graphic here. This is a type two plant growth regulator, which again, Paclobutrazol, canvas, that's a type two plant growth regulator. And what this is showing us here is this bottom, this is relative leaf water content, is this access, and this is days after withholding water. And so what we are showing here is that trees treated with the type two plant growth regulator, like canvas that, are able to retain moisture in their leaves for a longer period of time compared to untreated plants. Here again is a trial that was done by Rainbow up in St. Louis Park in Minneapolis. And again, this is Baroque, and you can see the difference here with our treated versus our untreated plants here. Untreated, again, showing signs of leaf scorch, symptoms of leaf scorch, rather. And our treated here showing, looking greener, lustrous, and not showing signs of leaf scorch. Here's another example. This is from Denver, Colorado. And if you've ever been to Denver, you know that Denver is basically a desert on a plateau. So it is a high elevation desert for the most part. Does not get a lot of rainfall. Uh, you know, legendary for getting a lot of snowfall, but these are like events that happen here and there. So again, not a lot of uh, water moisture in the soil that is being retained. And this is in the parking lot of a target. These are linden trees. 
And so again, these are trees that are in the middle of, this is like the worst case scenario for a plant. You're planted in a desert in a parking lot in Target. I couldn't think of a worse place to be if I was a tree. But again, we have one year after application, we have our untreated, as you can see. I mean, just really just textbook leaf scorch. Uh, we have uh, the browning necrosis followed by a halo of uh, yellow, that chlorosis. And then that green leaf, just, just textbook um, browning here, just, just textbook drop stress compared to our treated. Again, showing no symptom of the drought scorch. And see, this was taken, so these were treated in the summer of 2015. The picture was taken in the summer of 2017. So these are actually two years old. Um, and as you know, we've talked about, we've seen in some of our pictures, we're gonna get a three year, in some cases, three year, two to three year response with trees when this is applied. So again, as we saw in that picture, we're getting two years of drought resistance that's been induced to this plant. Uh, we might go into that third year because of the growing conditions there. So this is not a, a treatment that needs to be repeated year after year after year. Going back to that idea of doing fertilization, you know, depending upon our rates, we might need to go back year after year after year. This is a way to help the tree and possibly, you know, get one more treatment done that a client would be unwilling to do if they're if they're resistant to a yearly fertilization program. Well, now we have an option for a multi-year treatment that's going to help the tree and help them out. Moving now into the disease resistance. So again, across the board on many species, we see a, re um, a, a, a reduction in the instance of fungal leaf diseases. Uh, here we see we are looking at a Norway maple that is affected by tar spot. So again, we can see the tree on our left. Um, heavily affected by tar spot, untreated, the tree on our right, almost no instance of tar spot. Uh, and again, there's a couple different things that we're doing here. We are, again, we are creating a thicker cuticle. And if you think about how that leaf disease wants to start affecting and damaging that plant, it's going to, that disease spore is going to land on that cuticle. It's going to drop its feeding tube, its, its hostoria down to that cuticle into the cells, start doing damage. And so if we have that thicker cuticle, it's just going to be that much more difficult for that uh, fungus to reach down in there and start doing damage. Likewise, we have this increased amount of trichome hairs, and those trichome hairs might just repel that spore from being able to germinate um, altogether. Because again, it needs to come in contact with that leaf surface, it needs to come in contact with water, and then it needs to start germinating. And so if we have these uh, these trichome hairs that might just completely keep that spore from coming in contact with that leaf surface. Here's some another great um, picture here. Again, this is uh, published data from the uh, Morton Arboretum, and what we're seeing again is this reduced instance of apple scab. And so we can see one again going back to this chlorophyll production. Our tree on the right is treated. We can see that darker, greener leaf. And as I mentioned, as we're inducing disease resistance. This isn't a, a treatment for disease. We're not eliminating the disease from the plant, but we're making the plant uh, more um, able to res resist these diseases. And so we can still see in this picture, we still see instances of this apple scab. But when we compare that to the treated, or the untreated rather, um, it really is like night and day. Um, so we are seeing some great response there. So not only are we seeing this with some of our leaf diseases, but we also see it with some of our canker diseases. And again, if you think about a canker disease, canker diseases are very weak pathogens. There are very few canker diseases that are going to come on on a completely healthy tree. You know, we look at something like apple scab. If we have a healthy apple tree that is prone to apple scab and we have the right conditions, it's going to be affected by apple scab. It's not true of many of our canker diseases, like Phytophthora canker on blue leaf spruce. It's only moving in on trees that are already predisposed by some other form of stress. And so if we have a stress tree and we have a, a canker disease that, again, likes that tree, then you're going to have that issue. And so if we apply canvas that we already talked about, you know, we are going to improve this, this drought resistance. And one of the, if you noticed when the tusper canker affects a blue spruce. 
it's often these drought stress blue spruces that it likes to go after. And so if we can help the plant be more drought resistant, well then we're going to help it be more disease resistant in this certain instance. And so what we see here, again, this is from the Morton Arboretum, this published data from the Morton Arboretum, is that when we are treating our plants with canvastat, the soil application of canvastat, we are drastically reducing the instance and the severity of phytosporic like, canker on these blue spruces compared to our control. So again, we have this access is talking about disease severity rating, our lower access is talking about um, months after treatment. And so again, we can see that when we started this trial, they were all about the same same spot, and as the trial went on, our untreated got worse and worse while our treated um, stayed down there below our thresholds. So we were just talking about fungal diseases. We could also induce resistance with our bacterial diseases. So I'm not sure how many of you out there are dealing with fire blight, but what we're doing here is it's not that again. It's, this is not a bacteria side. Um, some of you, uh, if you've done some research in the Pacobutrazol, or if you've heard one of us, the uh, rainbow person, talk about Pacobutrazol in the past, you know that Pacobutrazol is a related, it's a triazole fungicide. It's, re it's related to mycobutanol. It's related to uh, propotanazole. And so in some cases, especially with foliar applied um, Pacobutrazol, like Primtex, we might say that, well, we're getting this disease resistance because we actually are using a fungicide. And so there, there's some truth to that, but it's definitely not a bacteria side. It has no bacteria serial um, properties whatsoever. What we're doing here is, again, it is, this is kind of that growth control thing. So we are reducing the amount of new tip growth. Fire blight can impact that young tip growth. It can make its way in between the cells of that young tip growth and start doing damage. And so if we are simply reducing the amount of area that can be affected, then we're reducing the, uh, just that, we're reducing the instance of that disease. And so what this trial is showing us here is this blue bar is our control. So these trees were not treated in any way. Our red bar is showing copper control. It's co-sided as a type of copper, which again is a common landscape uh, fire blade protocol when we're applying copper um, in late winter, and then applying copper again at bloom to reduce the amount of inoculum. And then finally, the yellow column is representing our um, application of paclobutrazol. And so again, what we're seeing here across the board is, while you know we can argue the copper seems to be doing better, if we compare just our paclobutrazol to our untreated control, we are drastically, again, reducing the amount of, statistically, reducing the amount of fire blight instance. Here is another trial just to show that, again, in this case here, you'll look at this copper and you'll say, oh, well, that copper is not doing as well. In this case here, the part of the trial design was seeing if we could get um, adequate control of fire blight using reduced rates of copper. And so, again, what the conclusion was is we definitely don't want to reduce our rates of copper, but also, when we're comparing this to our canvas stat treatments, we are getting really great control um, of fire blight. Moving on to another common bacterial disease of our landscapes, uh, here is bacterial leaf scorch. And so if we think about how bacterial leaf scorch is really affecting the plant, again, it's clogging up that xylem tissue. So, you know, one is, is that bacteria is growing and clogging up the xylem. The other thing is, of course, is the tree is responding and blocking up its xylem tissue, trying to prevent that spread of the bacteria. And so when we're seeing the symptom of uh, bacterial leaf scorch, what we're, we're seeing is really a, a drought-induced symptom. It's because we're getting less water flow through the plant. So the plant, is, the plant and the bacteria are inducing these drought-induced symptoms. So this is where everything kind of becomes interrelated, is that if we just discuss how we can reduce the amount of drought stress in a plant, so if we can reduce the amount of drought stress in the plant, and we are trying to combat a pathogen that is inducing drought stress, then we can help the plant to withstand this attack for a longer period of time by applying the canvas step. And so what we're seeing here in this photograph, again, is this is, in this case, this isn't uh, we didn't have controls, but what we had is the trees here. This is more of what we would call like a clinical trial, where 
we have our trees here that were affected with the um, bacterial leaf scorch applied with CAMSTAT, and then the next year we are seeing just a drastic reduction in the amount of leaf scorching ants because we're making the plant more dry resistant. Uh, no bacterial style properties whatsoever. We know that bacterial leaf scorch is a, it's a chronic disease. There's no way to get rid of it. Uh, once it's in the plant, it's always in the plant. Your management protocols are really just trying to keep that plant as healthy as you can for a long period of time. And so we can say that an application of canvas back can really help keep that tree healthy for a longer period of time. And again, going back to this idea of, you know, growth control um, being positive, what this chart from Dr. Glenn is showing us here is that we have here on our left axis, the amount of this particular phytodefense compound on our lower axis, we have relative shoot growth. And so what this is showing us is that the slower the plant is growing, the more it's able to produce defense compounds versus the faster a plant is growing, the less resources are being put into these defense compounds. So again, if we can artificially ask the plant to not grow as quickly by using canvas that, the plant's going to be able to reinvest those resources into these defense compounds, which is going to make it more resistant to these diseases. We move now into urban stress, and one of the big things in the, you know, our built environment is we are limiting our ability to grow roots. Um, we are putting our plants in these areas where it, they're not conducive to root development. Uh, we are often, through development, severing roots, and the plant is forced to try to regrow roots. And so, again, using canvas that we are able to increase the amount of fine root growth um, in many different species in many different areas. And so, again, this is six years after treatment. You can see the difference in the amount of absorptive root growth here. Um, here is our untreated on the left. These are street trees and planting boxes. Uh, our um, untreated here on the left or street treated on the right. And you can really see the difference in that absorptive root growth across different species. So again, this is a pine species, a ponderosa pine. Again, you can see the difference in our absorptive root growth here, uh, our untreated versus our treated. This is done at the University of Minnesota. This is sugar maple. You can see the amount of extension here and the amount of um, mass difference here. When we look at our untreated versus our uh, treated, again, that's a sugar maple. This is uh, more data from the University of Minnesota. This is Dr. Jeff Gilman. And what these graphs are showing us here is we have our black dots represent our untreated. And then we have our red and green dots, which represent different rates of canvas stat. And so what we're showing here is that we are able to reduce above ground biomass. And while we are reducing above ground biomass, we're actually increasing below ground biomass. And so, again, just to show there's a lot of data out there that supports this idea that we are able to produce more fine root growth by asking the plant not to put so much energy into that top root. Now, again, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. Uh, and this has to do not only with appearance. So we talked about appearance and chlorosis um, earlier on in our discussion. Um, you know, we're in this kind of talking about urban stress and root development right now. But if we go with this idea, that if we are in an area with a high pH soil and we have a tree species like a pin oak that is sensitive to iron chlorosis when planted in a high pH soil, we know in a high pH soil, iron can get tied up. Then with that theory, with the thought that if we're in a high pH soil, iron is going to be tied up. And if we have a sensitive species that's sensitive to iron chlorosis like a pin oak, then every single pin oak in that soil is going to be yellow. And we know that's not true. Uh, I mean, again, often we do find this situation, and we find whole sites in this situation, but it's not across the board. Um, this picture shows it here perfectly, where we have in the foreground here, we have a yellow chlorotic pin oak, while its neighbor is green, and its neighbor back here in this uh, front yard is green. So we have to ask ourselves, why is that? Um, you know, how can, is there really that much variation in this 10 feet? And there might be, but there's not in this case. And so... What Dr. Watson has found at the Morton Arboretum is that healthy trees with a healthy root system, so trees with a 
better intact root system, the healthy root system, are less likely to be chlorotic. So if you have a pin oak in a high pH soil and it has a great root system, you're not going to see that type of chlorosis. If we dive down a little bit more here, this is research by Dr. Don Marks, and what he found is, again, true the healthy root system can influence its rise of the sphere, so that area right around the roots, that little area right there around the roots, it can influence that by two whole pH points. So again, if we have a tree with a well-developed root system, it can influence the area where it's mining resources from a pH of 8, or something like iron would be tied up, to a pH of 6, where iron would be free to be taken up by the plant. So being able to increase root development has a huge advantage uh, for our plants for a lot of different reasons. If we look even more here, so we're looking at some research. So this is the ISA Best Management Practices on Root Management. Um, I would suggest you pick this book up for a lot of different reasons. It's pretty cheap. I think it's like less than $10, it may be $10 at the most. Um, has a lot of great uh, information in there. But right in our industry standards, so this is published again by the International Society of Arboriculture, right in our industry standards, we have a statement in root management that says, Paclobutrazole may increase length and dry weight of regenerated roots in some species. So again, this is something that we can do to help after we've had something where we um, have had a lot of damage to roots in construction areas. And so what we're seeing here, just as an example of this, this was a trial that um, I was a part of when I was at the Bartlett Research Laboratories. And this was originally, this was a tree root assessment trial. So what we did is we cut roots on one side of the tree at different intervals, and we pulled them to one degree to see if we had come up with a, a tree risk metric. And so we did this until we cut right up to the base of the tree. The next year, and this was done by Dr. Tom Smiley, the next year uh, what we did was we did a a uh, recovery trial. So we took these trees where we cut off half of the root system on one side of the tree, well, I mean all the way up to the trunk of the tree, um, and then see what we could do to help them recover. And so as an example here, on our left we have a tree that was treated with canvastat, so half of the root system was cut off and then it was treated with canvastat. On our right we have a tree, again, half of the root system was cut off and then we had done nothing to it. And so what you're seeing here and again, one year after treatment, you can see the difference in our treated tree with canvastat. So again, darker, greener foliage, no dieback, compact-looking plant versus our treated or untreated plant where we're seeing chlorosis, tip dieback, um, really, again, a, a night and day difference with the application. Just another practical um, application up there in the field. So this here was a... Um, a bur oak. This was originally growing in a savanna-like stand of bur oaks until this grocery store decided to, to expand its parking lot. And so you can see the extent of their tree protection here. Not only was that the only part of the, the root system that was protected, but the grade was raised. It might be difficult to see in this picture. Actually, here in this lower picture, you can see it very well. So the grade was raised. So the entire root system of this tree was affected by construction. Now, brokes are a very tough plant. This was in our initial research with canvastat. And so this is definitely a case study. This isn't something that, you know, we can really pin on, you know, it was the canvastat that did it. But we applied canvastat. Uh, we did some other treatments. And so this happened in 2002. This is the tree in 2004. This is the tree in 2011. Um, I have a tree, I have a picture of this tree from 2016 where it looks exactly the same. So just another option, this opens up the option of helping to treat these trees after um, some traumatic damage. This tree here, again, as I've said before, this is definitely, I would definitely say this is, you know, results not typical, but again, it opens up the possibility. So if we look at this white oak tree here in 1989, I think many of us would say that there, this tree is not worth the investment in a lot of resources. Uh, many of us probably say, you know, it, depending upon the situation, the targets involved, we should probably cut this plant down. But because this is more an arboretum, they have a lot of leeway. And so in this case here, the tree was pruned to remove the dead wood. 
Uh, we had radial trenching done here. Where again, we were affecting spoke of soil after the drip line around the tree. So again, we're decompacting, adding um, soil amendments based upon a uh, soil analysis, and we applied canvas that. And so again, we look at this tree. We fast forward five years, and it is it's pretty incredible. Again, now again, the deadwood was removed, but if we look at this plant five years later, and then we look at this plant again, all the way up in 2014, we have a thriving, beautiful tree providing all the resources, ecosystem services that the tree can provide, habitat for birds, habitat for all these other vertebrates and invertebrates. Um, and again, you know, if we went back to 1989, it would probably would have been a removal. So again, I'm not saying that we can do this for all of our trees that look like that, but we have now have opened up the possibility um, with some of these treatments uh, and an integrated approach to these treatments as well. Um, and so this is some stuff that we've been looking at here recently, especially around some of these coastal areas where saltwater intrusion is becoming more and more of an issue. Um, we're going to be putting out some trials here uh, this year to see if we can quantify this with Canvas app, but this is some data. Um, this comes out of India, I believe, and what they're finding is that, again, soil applications of paclobutrazol, which, again, this is the, the active ingredient in canvas that are able to help trees um, be more resistant to the effects of saltwater intrusion um, in the root system. And so what we can see here, what this is showing us is percent survival. There are a few different trees here, but if we look at the salt treated control, so these were trees that were drenched with salt water, and the percent survival were down around 10% survival. If we look at the salt treated paclobutrazol, we are at, I mean, this is a higher rate, then we are at around 70% survival. So, some really cool research um, to start thinking about, especially if you're in one of these coastal areas with saltwater intrusions an area is an issue. But even if you're in one of these areas where snow is an issue and you're putting down a lot of salt to melt snow and ice, we know, of course, that can run off into the root zones, get plowed into the root zones of, um, of some of our nice ornamental trees. So, again, opening up possibly another um, great use for uh, this product. We also know that, again, you know, practically speaking, we are not only are we only reducing the amount of top growth that's going on, but, or excuse me, tip growth, we're reducing all the top growth. So not only the tips of the plant, but as well as we are reducing the amount that the stem is growing, so we're making smaller growth rings. And this plays a part, too, with the root flares. So not only can we maintain trees, in areas like this where we have a tree rate for a longer period of time, but if we have a tree that's close to a driveway or a sidewalk, we're going to be able to reduce the amount of that buttress root or woody root that can eventually lift that sidewalk. So again, the plant's still going to grow. That's the one thing I always stress, the plant is still going to grow. We're not stopping it from growing, but we can drastically reduce, you know, the amount that it's growing in some of these cases with the structure. So let's quick move on to our final topic with the time we have left, and that is reduction of labor. Um, so there are some great options here when we talk about reducing labor uh, for many of us here. And so I always like to say, you know, don't hate growth regularly. You got to do what you got to do, right? Um, but here's some of our um, trials here. So one thing that we know we're going to do is we're going to drastically reduce the amount of biomass that we're removing from plants after they've been treated with plant growth regulators. So in this study here, we reduced uh, as much as 50% of the amount of biomass over the trial period here. Now, this wasn't with canvas that this was full of applied trim tech, um, but again, the results would be similar um, with similar size plants and things of that nature. When we look at reduction in labor, so I don't know how many out there are managing tree form type Thing. So, you know, we have this tree form the hollies uh, that need to be lollipopped or balled over, uh, ligustrum, wax myrtles, um, uh, what do we have? We have uh, crab apples, uh, maybe cherry trees. Some of these trees that we have to maintain is these tight balls. It takes a lot of labor. 
uh, depending upon where you are in the country, this might have to happen once or twice a year. Um, so again, using plant growth regulations in canvas that we can hold that shape for a longer period of time and reduce the intervals we needed to go do pruning. And so this was a case study that we were a part of. And what we have here is we have about 100 of these preferred hollies that have been tree formed and are maintained as little balls. Uh, prior to treatment, it would take three pruning events at 75 hours. So three pruning events a year of a total of 225 hours per year. After our first year of treatment, we were able to reduce that to two pruning events at a total of 15 hours apiece. So we went from 225 hours a year to prune these hollies down to 30 hours per year to prune these hollies. Last year, we repeated that same thing. So last year, and this is after one application in 2016, last year, same thing. We went from 225 hours a year prior to treatment down to 30 hours. This approximate cost per tree was $5. We're down here in North Carolina here, so we expect, you know, we talk about a three to two year period of growth control. Right now, we're counting on at least two years. Uh, we're going to, of course, continue to monitor this, see where we go. But so this is the plants 53 weeks after treatment. This is the plant 17 months after treatment. So this is the day they were treated. Uh, or excuse me, this was, they were treated in May. This was several months after treatment. And this is the, the picture here over a year after treatment. So pretty incredible um, power right there as far as being able to hold this tree, reduce labor, things like that. The other thing that we will talk about here is just getting on ladders. Um, you know, if you can I'd give me a, a rope and a harness any day, and put me in a tree, but you know, ask me to get on an A spring ladder with a piece of power equipment, and that is, I mean, I can't think of anybody that's looking forward to doing that. Uh, so again, going back to this idea, this seems that you know it's hard to quantify, but you know, the safety aspect on these trees and shrubs that we would have to get on a ladder to prune, the ability not to have to do that. Um, in this case here, you know, I think there's many companies now that even have, you know, requirements that you have somebody holding the ladder. So you have two people pruning the shrub. So, I mean, that's a labor thing right there. Imagine not having to have two people to prune a shrub. And then just the, the inherent danger of being on a ladder holding a piece of sharp power equipment. Um, so, again, being able to alter our, our labor and our pruning things around having to do this. Um, I think is incredible. So one more quick, this is another case study. Um, in this case here, what we have is we have 24 American elm hybrids that are planted in this 10 inch planting strip and they need to maintain their side. So we have some balconies here. These people want to overlook their balconies at a river walk that is off here in the distance, not in the picture. So it is crucial that these trees maintain their size. Now we can argue that, you know, the right tree, right place all day long, but you know, as we often know, you know, we kind of, we get what we get, right? So in this case here, it took 48 man hours to prune these trees. So that cost the company, this was what they charged the client, but approximately speaking, it cost the company here that was contracted to do this $50 per man hour. And so that included the insurance, the salary, all that different stuff that, you know, if you run a business, goes into how you come up with your main hourly rate, their cost is at $50. So it costs the company approximately um, $2,400 to prune these trees. They charge the client about $3,800. I'd probably just get cut off. Um, and they made 37% profit off this job, which isn't too bad, uh, really, in our industry. Um, now, we had talked about coming in and doing a plant growth regular canvas stat. So in this case here, these are hybrid um, elm trees. So we came up with a the B rate, which again, at um, just kind of your stock cost, that's going to cost 87 cents an inch to do this uh, for these trees. They're approximately 20, or excuse me, 240 inches in diameter. So the cost in the product was $208, approximately just a little bit more than half a gallon's worth of canvas stat in this case here. It took two man hours to do this. Uh, so it cost the company $308.80. And actually, that's 
this is a case study. I was that second guy, and I was kind of helping him out. So really, it only cost half that. But whatever, we're, we're going to go with this for the case study part of it. So anyhow, they charged this client one thousand thirty-five dollars, and they made seventy percent profit versus the thirty-seven percent profit. Now, many of you guys are out there saying, "Well, you know, I get paid to prune trees, man. Like, why are you? Know, I don't want to reduce my all how often I need to prune trees." Well, in this case here, so this is kind of like the best case scenario because, you know, this, of course I'm going to give you guys the best case scenario. But in this scenario here, they still had money in their budget. They still had that money for pruning. Uh, but now what they were able to do is they were able to take that money, take it away from that annual pruning of these elm trees, and put it into other pruning events. So now they're doing more large deadwood pruning. They're doing more structural pruning. They're able to do more plant health care work uh, that, again, this contractor captured. So, and it, you know, again, if you do plant health care, you know that is also going to be more profitable. So it opened up their, their labor. The money that they were bringing in didn't go away. It just went into other things. So they're able to help the client. They're able to make a good profit on helping the client, helping the trees survive in that area for a longer period of time, plus opening up other business opportunities for them. So, again, best case scenario. But, again, when we talk about this, we're always talking about, you know, what's the possibility? So now we have a new possibility here. Uh, to help our client, help our trees in the landscape. Um, and so, again, it's just a, another another idea for people to be thinking about when it comes to, you know, managing trees with growth regulators. And so, again, you know, what did we just talk about? The cannabis that we can help us to improve the appearance of the plant, make it healthier, improve drought resistance, disease resistance, urban reduce urban tree stress, and reduce labor around pruning events. So, I neglected to mention this earlier on, but Again, if you open up your little control panel there, there's a little arrow there at that, the top of that uh, rectangle. If you look down, they, we do have a handout for this again. If you click on that little tiny um, uh, triangle by where it says handout, we do have the uh, Canvas Opportunity Guide handout that you can download uh, right now. So I would encourage you to do that. I should have said that earlier. Um, you can do that right now. Um, not only do we have the opportunity to guide with Canvas Stat, but if you visit our website, treecarescience.com, we have a whole host of diagnostic guides built around um, tree and shrub care protocols. So they're broken down by um, diseases and pests. This is an example of a rise of spirit needle cast diagnostic guide. Again, you can find this on our website, treecarescience.com. We have some more webinars coming up for our spring series. So again, on Monday, March 19th, next Monday, we're going to have a talk on spotter and lantern fly, which I'm super excited about. If you're on the East Coast, definitely uh, be looking for that one. Um, on Monday, March 26th, so the Monday after that, uh, you'll get to hear me talk about cytosphere canker management um, and how we can use uh, camp stats to promote healthy trees there. So uh, should be a good talk. Uh, and then finally, on Friday, March 30th, well, we do have an EAB talk, um, treatment strategies and options. And again, if you're in an area that is affected by EAB or uh, will likely be affected by EAB, highly encourage you guys to scope that out. Again, all these can be found on our website, truecarescience.com, under education, um, all of our past webinars, including today after it's published, and you'll be able to find the upcoming webinars in the future as well. So with the time we have left, I'm going to pop open our questions field here. Bear with me a second, and let's see. Um, if we have any questions, and see if I can answer any of them for you. Um, so let's see here. Just bear with me here, y'all. Um, see here. So a question here is: Does PBZ tend to reduce potential storm damage over time by increasing branch diameter relative to branch length? Um, so I'm going to read that again. So the package results tend to reduce potential damage over time by increased branch diameter relative to branch length. Uh, that's a great question. Um, again, I don't know if it's very well researched, um, but that is certainly a potential. Again, if you're looking at that branch aspect ratio, uh, basically saying that you know you want the branch to be wider at the base versus um, you know the length of the the tree. Um, that could be, um, there's some potential there, um, but again, not very well researched and I don't have the greatest answer, but it's definitely a, a possibility for you. Uh, let's see here. Um, 
might be it. So here's a great question. Um, well, we have one here is, can you provide us with a list of known species that Camaset does, does increase the root mass of? Um, certainly we can uh, compile uh, that and um, you can feel free to, uh, we can get that to you. Um, the other question here is, considering the root development benefits, would you recommend using on new tree planting? So that's a great question. So I'll read that again. Considering the root development benefits, would you recommend using on new tree plantings? Um, so we are currently researching that right now. The key thing there is, is um, really dialing in on the rate. Um, we have uh, we've had some instances where we've had really great success in doing that. We have other instances where we've had some really drastic failures um, in in that. So what we're doing right now in our research is there's definitely a huge potential there. Uh, and again, the idea would be. You know, you plant a tree, it takes a while for it to establish anyhow. So instead of, you know, let's help just to encourage to put out that fine root growth. Um, and then once it breaks regulation, it's going to be a better established plant that's going to be able to grow healthier in its spot. Um, the problem right now, that, or I shouldn't say the problem, but where we're running into challenges is, is again, with that rate. Uh, and we haven't really discussed, you know, dosing and some of the ways that you would do that. But um, uh, we're definitely working to fine tune that for sure. So, and when we figure it out, we'll let everybody know, don't worry. <laughs> and with that, it looks like we do not have any more questions. And that's just fine, guys. So again, thank you all for uh, attending today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, Again, for any other questions, you can feel free to see my contact information there. Feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, we have our upcoming webinars. Again, feel free to about those. And uh, finally, of course, check out our website, treecarescience.com, uh, for this and other recordings, and as well as uh, any diagnostic support you might have. Um, again, y'all, thanks so much for your attention. Have a great afternoon, and we look forward to seeing you here sometime again soon. Have a good one. Bye.